Thank you very much, Paul, and it's my pleasure to be here in Moscow. Uh, about 15 years ago, we were going to organize the debate meeting here. Dr. Akaturin was going to do that, and we had to cancel it for various reasons, but I was pleased to see a photograph of Dr. DeBakey outside in the group pictures. So I was asked to talk about aortic valve repair and root surgery. And at the Cleveland Clinic, our volume of aortic surgery, this is specifically the aorta, has increased over time. And we do over 100 aortic valve repairs now on a yearly basis. And one of the key things is failures over time. And so I'm going to talk to you about uh, the issue of a repair, starting first with the bicuspid aortic valves um, that we presented recently. So one of the issues with bicuspid valves is it's typically in young patients, and the other option is a mechanical valve with a risk of thrombosis or growth into the, the valve itself. And if you look at the 10-year data, the freedom from events is only 10%. So the results with mechanical valves are not that great. And if you look at pericardial valves versus the homographs or allografts, the curves are completely superimposable. And we have done some 1,760 uh, patients with homographs, and we basically abandoned that and only use it for endocarditis. But shown here in blue is our rate of a repair of valves, and it's predominantly in the young patients. What about then durability of repair versus other approaches? So here's our freedom of reoperation for biological AVR versus tricuspid in white, gray, and bicuspid valves. And there's virtually no difference in the early durability and repairs versus uh, the replacements if you look at tricuspid valves, and I'll come to that, which is reimplantations basically. And once you're out beyond 10 years, you're better off with a repair. So our first major study we did on bicuspid valves was uh, close to 2,000 patients. And here we were particularly looking at, was there a difference in mortality rate between bicuspid valve alone versus bicuspid valve in aorta replacement? And basically, there was no difference. The other important point about this study, shown in the bottom here, was that if we left an aorta that was less than 4.5 centimeters behind, the risk of a further aortic event was only 0.2%. And that's why in the guidelines, we came to the conclusion that you only need to replace the aorta if it's more than 4.5 centimeters. And our basic repair technique for a bicuspid valve is a cabrol sutures, application of uh, a of, uh, incompletely joint leaflet, and then a figure of eight sutures that we use to hitch up the commissures at the same time. And here's just an example of that and uh, with the cabral sutures in place. And here you've got the Gore-Tex sutures, which I tie on the outside and put clips on to make sure that doesn't unravel. Here's a patient with a bigger root where we're doing a remodeling operation and have cut away the non-coronary sinus. And there's the remodeling operation of sewing that uh, beveled graft to the annulus. An operation I've tried now on uh, close to 10 patients, I'm not sure if it's going to hold up long term, is to actually free up the commissure and put that within <coughs> the aorta and sew that within a tube graft above uh, the level of the original site of uh, its position. It remains to be seen if this will hold up, but that's another option, and there's just a view of that. There's another view of it. So we looked at our repairs uh, with the objective to look at survival and freedom from reoperation and freedom from aortic valve replacement. So we did 728 patients, and the mean age was 42 years in that group of patients. Now, the majority of the patients had severe aortic valve regurgitation, and that was the primary reason why they had a, a surgery for symptomatic bicuspid aortic valve disease. Now, apart from that, about 38% uh, of those patients also had concomitant aorta procedures. Well, here are the outcomes. So the mortality rate was 0.41%, stroke rate 0.27%. So as far as repairing, there was no price to be paid in repairing them. What about survival? Well, out to 10 years, it was 94%. So survival was good, and obviously these were younger patients. 
and the hazard of death was early, and as you saw, it was very low early on. So what were the incremental risk factors for death after bicuspid valve repair? Well, the ones that one would expect, mitral valve regurgitation, higher uh, BUN, in other words, kidney disease, and the late phase were older age, higher preoperative New York Heart Association, which argues potentially for, as with mitral valves, that patients should be operated earlier, and less fractional shortening, in other words, poor ejection fraction. And here's an interesting finding in that particular study. I've always been worried about the gradients at the end of a repair, but the interesting thing is those gradients fall very quickly after surgery, and then there's virtually a linear relationship over time as far as the increase in gradient and likely need for further repair. So what about the reoperation? So there were 105 patients who required reoperation in the study. The interesting thing is that very few of those were for aneurysms. Most of them were for prolapse and a combined aortic valve stenosis development, and a lot of them. The other important point is, although they needed quite often a fairly substantial repair apart from replacements, there were no deaths in this patient population. So 728 patients, 0.4% procedure-related death overall. And here's freedom from reoperation out of 15 years. And the hazard was fairly constant after the initial uh, couple of weeks. And here's over time. Now, if you look at this carefully, it appears that the more recently operated patients did better. However, we don't have the data out of 15 years, so this should really be stippled lines. But at least we think we're doing better than what we used to do in the earlier phases of bicuspid valve repairs. What about then when to operate on patients with bicuspid valves and enlarged aortas? In a study we did many years ago, we found that 15% of patients who ruptured and developed dissection in Marfan patients, the size was less than five centimeters. And we did a similar study in patients with bicuspid valves and found exactly the same virtually at 12.5%. And when we looked at these patients, we found that a lot of the patients who were dissecting they were shorter in stature, and we then, based on the Framingham heart study, we figured that if we used the cross-sectional area in square centimeters and divided the patient's height by uh, patient's height, then if that ratio was more than 10, we would recommend surgery. What that really meant is that a short female at 4.7 centimeters would require surgery, and a tall male at about 5 centimeters. So here's maximum size versus height, and when you use that ratio, then height is no longer a factor as far as timing of surgery. So the other operation that we use a lot for uh, aortic valve repairs is the David reimplantation operation. I think when you're planning to do these operations, you have to look, at, as we put it here, the class schema at everything. You've got to look at the commissures, the leaflets, the annulus, the sinuses and the sinotubular junction, and you have to get all of those working together to make a good and durable repair. And one of the reasons, obviously, we're also repairing these valves and operating on these patients is because of the risk of dissection. This happens to be a patient with lowest deeds. There are some patients where, obviously, where you cannot repair the valves, and here's a patient with Marfan's that it was too far gone and this valve was not repairable. So the way I like to do this is to use plagiated sutures in the left ventricular alpha tract and pass it through a tube graft. For most patients, a 30 or 32 millimeter tube graft. And then here's the aortic valve freed up completely. And it's very important that you get deep down here in the area of the right ventricular outflow tract so you get below the level of the valve. And here the sutures now put through the left ventricular alpha tract and there you see them again in the left ventricular alpha tract. There's another picture of that. And then what I do is I put those through the tube graft and tie those down around a hay gauze because you don't want to end up with stenosis at the end of the operation. And on the other hand, you want to get it down to a normal size. You get maximal apposition of those leaflets. And here's an example of one with a nice Mercedes sign at the end with about three to five millimeters of apposition. And that's what you're aiming to get. Here's another one. This is a, a big a basketball player, uh, one of the professionals. And you see here we use a 34 tube graft and a big uh, valve in this case. The coronary artery buttons then are reattached. 
In a lot of these patients, particularly the Marfan patients, we free up the aortic valve, but we also have to do the mitral valve, and here we've done a caudal transfer and a sliding repair, and there a, a Cosgrove band has been put in at the same time prior to completing the David reimplantation. We looked at our patients from a procedural aspect point of view, and the majority of our patients, we used 21 millimeter Hagar's. In 43% of the patients, we required a leaflet repair apart from just doing the reimplantation. This slide is a bit complex, but basically what it shows is that in 98% of the patients, the degree of aortic valve regurgitation got better. And we didn't hesitate, even if the patients had preoperative three or four plus aortic valve regurgitation to do a David reimplantation if the leaflets look good. And as you see, the majority of them had no regurgitation at the end. And here's the gradient uh, by body size with the Z-score showing no uh, correlation with gradients using the, the Hagar's. What about follow-up? So if you look at survival, the patients had the reimplantations, had the best long-term survival. The tailorings did not do quite as well. And that's partly because we use tailoring ma mainly in the older patients. That was the Marfan patients, 99%. What about repair durability? So the reoperation rate was exactly the same virtually for all the procedures. But obviously, I think some of these tailoring patients may have needed an operation but not, did not undergo it. The risk for failure was bicuspid valves. So the bicuspid valves failed earlier, and here's just a comparison of the tricuspid versus the bicuspid valves showing that increased failure rate. If we look by the underlying pathology, the Marfan patients and aortic dissection patients actually did very well with, once again, the bicuspids not doing as well. In a separate study, we looked at the patients who had Marfans or had appearance of Marfanoid features. This included Lowe's Deeds. And in the patients who failed, and they were in the Marfan group, all of them had a remodeling operation. And that resulted in us abandoning the remodeling operation for Marfan patients. And those of you who follow the literature will know that Tyra and David has also abandoned remodeling in Marfan patients. What about the patients that we did double valve repairs on? They seem to be holding up pretty good, so we continue to do that in that population. In a separate study, we looked at long-term data even further out. This is a more recent one as far as survival versus the matched US life, um, both for gender and age. And if you look at repairs, they did virtually the same as the matched population. With the biological valves, they start failing at about five to six years. And here's the hazard curve, once again, failing at about five to six years. Here's by the underlying procedure, with the remodeling and the reimplantations doing very well. And the Marfan patients here, once again, the underlying uh, procedure, survival, being very good with the bicuspids doing valve very well, and the Marfan's up there. And some of those would have been patients with dissection, and the dissection's generally not doing as well partly because they need or require multiple operations or rupture their false lumens. So here's a, a look at biological AVRs versus reoperation repair taken out to 12 years, showing that the lines cross uh, at about 12 years. But once again, you see this increasing failure and risk of reoperation, the biological valves occurring about seven to eight years. And I think that's part of the reason why we see increasing mortality rate in the biological AVRs. Here's freedom from reoperation, once again, slightly differently matched versus the biological AVRs. And here's tricuspids, and as I pointed out earlier, the tricuspids do very well compared to biological AVRs, and there's by underlying disease. So Tyron Davids and his data, he's got more recent uh, data. I didn't uh, have time to copy it down here, but 167 patients, 1.2 percent opt death, 92 percent survival. And I think the striking thing is 95 percent freedom from aortic valve replacement at uh, 10 years, which is the same for our patients. So I think it's a very durable operation in the general population. What about the patients then with Marfans in particular and David reimplantation? So we did a study of this to look at the safety, and we looked also at patients with Erlodanlos, loss, Lowe's Deeds, and Marfanoid patients. So we did 178 patients up to January of 2011, 
74% of them are men, average age 45. And the connected tissue disorders are shown here, with the majority being in Marfan patients. Here's a preoperative aortic valve regurgitation, and as I said, as long as the valves aren't, the leaflets aren't too badly damaged, then I think in 90% to 95% of those patients, you can keep that valve for the patient. So once again, we use the Hagar's and uh, concomitant procedures, including cabbage, mitral valve repair, and some of these Marfan patients. And here's a uh, number who had circulatory arrest. Uh, that was obviously typically patients with dissection or more extensive aneurysm. What about safety? Well, we never had a death in that 178 uh, group of patients, and there was uh, a very low risk of stroke. What about effectiveness for the connective tissue disorders? Survival, 94% out of eight years. Freedom from reoperation, 92%. Not quite as good as the general population, but still excellent. And the failures in those patients, there were three with endocarditis, and for those of you who had the double ATS meeting, it was interesting that Tyrone's seen that also. And then there were two technical failures. Um, these were my early experience, and I hope I'm better now than I used to be. And there was one patient who was reoperated for unknown reasons. He had two plus aortic valve regurgitation and had no symptoms and underwent reoperation at another institution. What about recurrence of aortic valve regurgitation? So we looked at this, and very few patients end up having three to four plus. So from that point of view, it's also durable, even though these are myxomatous valves and the failures um, occur over time. As far as aorta reoperations, here it looks like there's a spike early, but that's because we were doing elephant trunk procedures in a lot of these patients, so they were having their second stage uh, operations because of the elephant trunk second stage procedures. And here's just an example of a patient, executive of one of the big drug companies in the United States, and he had a descending aortic dissection and ischemia of his gut, we put stents in, and you can just see a bit of the stents there in the descending aorta. So here's an elephant trunk in the descending aorta. Here's a David reimplantation of his aortic root, and there are the two stumps of those, and those were connected together. And I saw him a, a few months ago still doing well. So from the point of view of David reimplantations in the patients with connected tissue disorders, uh, I think the results are really good, and I would encourage to use that more often. We don't really have very long-term data in our own experience beyond 10 years, but uh, Tyron Davis' recent presentation also supports increasing use of that. The one thing is this is an operation that requires precision and speed, and if uh, you get into trouble, you need to have a back-out plan. My plan is to do a homograft if I have to, but so far I haven't had to. And these kids, I hope they have a backup plan if something goes wrong. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions from the audience? <clears throat> Professor Alfieri. Yes, um, I, I would like to ask about aortic valve repair and the annuloplasty. Uh, in our experience, uh, the uh, subcommissural annuloplasty uh, in aortic valve repair was associated with a higher recurrence rate. Yeah. And uh, therefore, since then, we uh, do now a different type of annuloplasty. We just uh, dissected, like in David procedure, up to the base below the coronaries, and we go with a suture mm -hmm. all around, yeah. tying around the uh, yeah. and Hager dilator. So what is your experience? You don't have that uh, as an incremental factor for, for uh, recurrence, I noticed. So that would only really apply to the remodeling operations. And so I used to put a, a big Gore-Tex suture in the, in the left ventricular alpha tract, tie that around a Hagar's. I had some patients who developed a heart block and needed pacemakers. So I stopped doing that. So instead what I do is when I bevel the graft and I only use remodeling now for bicuspid valves with big roots, I then at the end I hook up a suture to close the gap in the graft so it won't stretch over time. So it's slightly different. Instead of putting a separate band, I put uh, sutures there that stop the expansion of, of the uh, Dacron bevel graft. Okay. Yeah. But I think that's an important point. Professor Von Segesser. 
Thank you very much, Lars, for a nice presentation. I have maybe not right, not understood correctly, but you recommend that in taller patients you would accept larger aortas uh, and not replace them if they fit some that criteria you have given? Yeah, so if you work that out, so I think most people would agree that in patients with a Marfan syndrome, although there's some recent uh, controversy about bicuspid valves, but in the thoracic aorta guidelines, the cutoff was five centimeters for bicuspid valve roots. And uh, if you then look at those patients, sure, the majority are gonna be tall males, and so we don't have a problem with doing them. The problem is the short females, and for example, Turner's syndrome. And clearly those patients dissect at a smaller size. They are all, Turner's, of course, they are also shorter. And to account for those patients being at greater risk at a smaller size, we use that calculation. So you use it only to, uh, for the smaller patients? Yes, basically rules, for smaller patients. Not for the large ones, because the physics are the same for both. If the radius is big, the wall tension is big. We agree yes, on that. so the bigger, the, obviously, the aneurysm, Laplace's law, the greater the tension. And so the taller the, the patients, they probably, in a sense, have a, normally a bigger aorta. Lars, you just mentioned the continuous suture on the valve rim. Uh, <clears throat> did you use this uh, often? Um, some people are using it routinely in yeah. Marfan patients, like Schaefer's, yeah. and uh, he's recommending that. Are you using that? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I, I have used it sometimes, but as you know, in patients with um, Marfan's, that leaflet is often very fragile. And what I didn't show in any of the pictures are, is that I usually try and hitch up at the commissure. So if the right leaflet is prolapsing, which is probably 70% of the time if you have a prolapse, I hitch up at the commissure and I don't do the running suture. Now, if it's a patient with a bicuspid valve with a prolapse, that typically is a thicker leaflet, then I'll sometimes use that. But generally, I try to do the hitching up at uh, the commissures. If there's a fairly strong nodular rentes, I will put a little plication stitch there. And, and usually it's just a millimeter or two that you have to gather up to make it work. Sometimes the leaflet is too short. Some people are <clears throat> using now extension of the leaflet with a yes. strip of pericardium. My personal experience is absolutely disastrous with that. I <laughs> do not recommend it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, as you know, there's quite a big uh, series from Saudi Arabia on that. And I think what's disconcerting is some of those patients come back with big clots sitting on the typically the pericardium. And uh, we recently just had Dr. Al-Khuri uh, present, in fact, two weeks ago at the Cleveland Clinic. And although he talked about it, he says he's rarely doing it now because he's had problems with it too. Yeah. Robert Dion from uh, Belgium. Uh, in the context of bicuspid valve, uh, I've uh, learned from Gibrin, who uh, was my successor now in Brussels, and yes. we developed many things together. Uh, I have learned with, uh, with him that uh, even if the bicuspid valve re uh, seems repairable without uh, reimplantation, if you look carefully at the base of the annulus, you see, uh, you see nearly the, the muscle of the right ventricle mm -hmm. through yeah. the, the base of the annulus. So he said to me, it's, uh, it's not good to just repair the valve and put a piece of Dacron yeah. on the aorta. And now he's uh, recommending to be very aggressive and do uh, really a Tyron David on all bicuspid valve if you see that, if you see the muscle transparent through, yeah. through, the, through the base of the... What, what, what do you think about that? So the majority of bicuspid valves, the root's not enlarged, as you know. So in those patients, I don't see that you need to do a full David reimplantation in those patients. In the patients with a big root, or as you say, that thinning out, Yes, then you've got to be aggressive. My preference is still to do a remodeling operation. Um, whether you should do a David, my feeling is that the mechanism of competence is very different. With a David reimplantation, you're taking a three leafed valve that's leaking centrally and you're bringing everything together. With a bicuspid valve, the mechanism of competence, is, if you do that, you will make prolapse of the leaflets. And so what you want the opposite is strength along the, the length of the leaflets, the tension on the leaflets. So when I do do a David 
reimplantation in a bicuspid valve, I'm typically putting in a 35 or a 38 milliliter tube graft. And the same when I do a remodeling, I'm using a 34, 38, just to keep that tension on those leaflets with, with the bicuspid valves. Otherwise, you get a prolapse, and then you end up having to put little sutures, as um, was mentioned just a moment ago by Marcus, to hitch up those leaflets, because now you've prolapsed them, now you've got to fix the leaflets. So you get yourself into trouble very quickly that way.